Okay, so welcome to lecture three of classifying homogeneous geometric structures. Okay, so last time, uh, just to recap, what I discussed was uh, the fundamental theorem of parabolic geometries, that there is this equivalence of categories between this upstairs perspective, uh, so-called regular normal parabolic geometries, and underlying geometric structures. So, um, so usually downstairs, it's a, it's a distribution, maybe some extra structure like a conformal structure or a splitting on it. Um, in general, these are called filtered G0 structures. Associated to uh, parabolic geometries, we introduce this uh, notion of harmonic curvature, okay, an important invariant. And um, when, uh, so you're flat if and only if curvature is zero, but also so that's an if and only if harmonic curvature is zero. Uh, I introduced this Cartel reduction method, which is uh, a natural method given that you're working with, uh, if you're working in the setting of Cartel geometries, um, basically you're, you're letting the structure group act on curvature and, and using that to, to reduce your bundle. And we saw this as, uh, as a way to, um, to classify second order ODs last time. I also emphasize the, the difference between so-called Cartel theoretic descriptions and uh, coordinate models uh, or Lie theoretic descriptions. The nice thing about Cartel theoretic descriptions is that you can, you can access some basic um, information that one would want to ask about homogeneous structures. So for instance, curvature. What is the curvature of this model? What is the holonomy of this model? Okay, things that are not so obvious or, or easy to access if you're just given a coordinate model or the theoretic uh, description. Okay, so where do I wanna to go today? So today I wanna to start out by um, talking to you about Costin's theorem. It's a very, very important theorem in the setting of parabolic geometries. Basically for this harmonic curvature, I introduced last time that this takes values in a certain Lie algebra cohomology group, but I've never actually uh, told you how to compute this Lie algebra cohomology. So Costin's theorem is a beautiful way of, of phrasing some nice linear algebra and accessing what the, um, where this object harmonic curvature lives. Secondly, um, so taking a cue off of some of the motivation that I introduced last time, these uh, Cartel theoretic descriptions, we're gonna axiomatize uh, some of that a bit more uh, today. So I'll introduce this notion, what I refer to as an algebraic model and how it's viewed as a so-called filtered sub-deformation. And then we're gonna apply all this to, uh, to the setting of two, three, five distributions. Okay, so multiply transitive, uh, meaning you're, you're tran transitive and you have some isotropy, non-trivial non isotropy. Okay, before I get to the technicalities though, um, let me just put things into a so-called, uh, in some historical context. Okay, so things go back to the 1910 paper so did I echo here. Um, so in 1910, Elie Carton wrote a landmark paper uh, given right here. And it's a difficult paper. Nowadays, it's universally known as the so-called five variables paper. And he established some remarkable equivalences between um, several things. So on the one hand, uh, context symmetries of so-called non-Mongean pair parabolic Grossard PD in the plane. Here's a simple or actually not so simple example uh, of one such equation. Uh, on the other hand, context symmetries of nonlinear involutive pairs of PDE in the plane. So here's a representative uh, type of equation here. And then on the other hand, um, well, that's three hands. So the, the, the symmetries of two, three, five distributions. Um, and we're going to concentrate just on this last aspect. Okay, we're not going to uh, go into detail on this nice um, geometry of PDE's uh, perspective. That's a nice story, but not for today. Okay, so an example being the helper Cartan equation. Um, he gave a total de force application of his equivalence method applied to two, three, five distributions. And then uh, he classified almost all complex multiply transitive structures. Okay, the maximal amount of symmetry that you can have is 14 dimensional. And that's where uh, one has a geometric realization of G2 coming up. For instance, it's the symmetries of uh, the two, three, five distribution associated to this helper Cartan equation. But in, in the sense of context symmetries, these two models also have G2 symmetry. Little caveat here, um, this small footnote. Uh, so one model was missed um, over C and Dubrov and Govorov in 2013 discovered it. So the 1910 paper is important in that it inspired and it strongly influenced our notions of how we study equivalence and symmetry over the last hundred years. Um, 
Also, there are several citations in the literature to the five variables paper concerning the Cartan connection constructed for 235 distributions. But this is false. Okay, so an important uh, observation that Pavel Romsky made um, a little over a decade ago, I guess, is the following, which I'll paraphrase. So the Cartan connection of 1910 is not a Cartan connection in the modern sense. So what do I mean here? Well, so the connection, that's another name for co-framing. And so the output of his equivalence method produces a con canonical co-framing, but it's not fully equivariant. Okay, so it, it lives on some P principal bundle, but the structure group P, um, right, the, the, the connection that he has is, is not equivariant, fully equivariant along the fibers. This is not at all obvious when you read Carton. I mean, it's, it's a difficult paper. Um, and even if you read it from top to bottom, uh, you, will, you will likely not have this impression. Um, so he, in particular, it's difficult because Carton did not write the full structure equations for his co-framing. There's two forms right at the top, uh, which, whose structure equations are just not written down. So it's, it's a testament to Pavel's uh, tenacity in, in, in working through this, that he, 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 he found those structure equations and observed that it's not actually a Carton connection. Okay, and just as a warning, historical warning, there are many inequivalent notions of Carton connection in the early literature. And um, yeah, some of them are just very different and some of them don't have any notion of equivariancy in there. Okay. As far as the modern connection, uh, Carton connection definition, it is clearly stated in Kobayashi 1972, although conceptually uh, certainly goes back to, to early notions of Carton, um, his espace generalisé in the 1920s, as well as some work of Tanaka uh, or even Kobayashi in 1955. Okay, but uh, the clearest statement of the definition is, uh, in my opinion, in, in, in Kobayashi's 1972 uh, transformation uh, groups book. Just continuing a little bit more with his history. Um, so Norovsky discussed with uh, Bryant, Robert Bryant in October, 2013. So I was a postdoc in, uh, in Canberra at the Australian National University and they happened to be visiting at the time. And so they had this, uh, this, this nice discussion about modifying Cartan's co-framing to obtain a Cartan connection. Okay, so, uh, so shortly after that discussion, uh, Robert found, found it and he circulated uh, this illuminating uh, email uh, where he stated what it, how, how, to, how to do this modica, modification. Okay, so brief extract is the following. My conclusion is that Carton, at the time that he wrote his five variables paper, was more interested in practical calculation and exposition than he was in a theoretical development of what later became Carton connections. And he chose his co-framing, solving his equivalence problem, so that the formulae that he needed to write down to explain his results would be as simple as possible. Nevertheless, not everybody was impressed. In Tanaka, you're gonna find the following quote. In his paper, Elie Cartan has really carried out such reductions in a messy and complicated manner. Okay, so I'll let you judge whether it's a tour de force or messy and complicated, but uh, certainly it's, it's, it's not bad to, to, to critically evaluate the, the literature. I mean, we, we know, I mean, Tanaka's efforts have resulted in this large theory that we recognize as Tanaka theory. It's very useful. Okay, so motivated questions for today. For homogeneous geometric structures, can one do classification more efficiently than what I showed last time, than what Cartan reduction would entail? Can one do this classification without setting up, for example, the full primary and secondary structure equations for the corresponding Cartan geometry? There's a lot of effort in doing this. Can one do classification algebraically and find their corresponding Cartan theoretic data. Okay. This is, this is a, an important point because existing classifications um, largely focus on presenting things in terms of coordinates or Lie theoretic models. Okay. So there's, there's lots of opportunity for development here in classification, improved classification. Okay, so today I wanna to take a look at this multiply transitive 235 classification from a modern perspective. Okay, and the first step towards doing this is to have some good linear algebra in the background, and that's the point of Costin's theorem. So we'll see how this fits in. Okay, so um, so let's uh, lay down some notation here. So let G be semi-simple, P parabolic. So we know that this arises from a grading, a Z grading on G, and P is gonna be the non-negative part of the grading. 
And we always have a grading element. So um, this is an element of the center of the, the G0 level. Okay, let's define some cochains. So let CK be uh, wedge K G minus star tensor G. And using the Lie algebra cohomology differential, one gets a complex as usual. Okay, and you could form cohomology as kernel mod the image. Okay, so motivations. Why are, uh, is one interested uh, from our perspective for, uh, in these cohomology groups? Harmonic curvature, we said, is valued in uh, H2. But because we're dealing with a regular normal geometry, so we're interested only in the positive subspace. So the subscript here referring to the grading, okay, so the Z eigenvalues. So Z acts on G, certainly, and then we induce the action on these cochain spaces. We can induce the action on these cohomology spaces. And so we're interested in the subspace of H2 on which Z acts with a positive eigenvalue. Second motivation comes from Tanaka prolongation. Okay, so we saw earlier that um, this bounds the amount of symmetry you could have for a given geometric structure. Uh, I didn't mention computational methods, and in general, it can be quite challenging to, uh, to compute the Tanaka prolongation, okay, given G minus and G zero data. Okay, remember, Tanaka prolongation is the maximal graded Lie algebra extending that given data, G minus and G zero, such that if, you're, if you have an element on the positive side, you want it to be visible, uh, to bracket non-trivially with something on the negative side. So um, instead of that general problem, however, suppose that you have a given graded Lie algebra G already, and you look at its negative part and the zero part, and you ask the question, is the Tanaka prolongation of this minus and zero part isomorphic to the given graded Lie algebra that I started with? Okay, this is a very different question, and it's, it's easier. Okay, and so we can attack this using Lie algebra cohomology. Okay, so let's, in particular, uh, first cohomology. Okay, so let's look at the relevant differentials here. So del zero and del one. If you write out the definitions, they look like this. Okay, so del zero of V is just this, um, this adjoint map, okay, restricted to the G minus level, G minus levels. Uh, del one has this definition. And so remember, we're interested in kernel mod the image. When I set this to be equal to zero, this becomes just the condition for eta being a derivation on G minus. Not quite the derivation that you might be used to because the output of this eta might, uh, is valued in general in G and not G minus. So these are called G value derivations on G minus. Okay? The image on the bottom, that's this, uh, this span of these adjoint maps here. Okay, so a little exercise. Um, prolongation of G minus G zero is isomorphic to G if and only if you look at this first cohomology group, you look at the positive subspace and it's just trivial, okay? Um, if you look at this quotient here, that's not surprising. It's basically just saying all these extra elements that one could have, well, they're, they're, they're actually already in what you have, okay? Here I'm using the fact that um, the adjoint map on, on G, on a semi-simple Lie algebra, right, it's injective. Okay, so I can identify all these images with, with G itself. Okay, so, and you get a similar statement if you want the prolongation of G minus to be equal to G. There you have to look also at the zero level. Okay, so one is interested in computing these two cohomology groups, H1 and H2, for appropriate uh, gradings. Okay, so in order to do this, I have to review some elementary Lie algebra structure theory. Now, if you're seeing this for the first time, this will definitely be too fast, okay? So um, uh, this is more for just for those that have seen this in say uh, first master's course on, um, on this material, just for laying down some notation and to give you a feel for how some of the computations go. Um, there's really only one bit uh, right at the very end of this section that I want you to remember. So if you're seeing this for the first time, just enjoy some of the pictures and then remember the thing uh, that I'll, I'll bring up uh, later, okay? So, Let's start with G being a complex semi-simple Lie algebra, H Cartan subalgebra. Example for SL3, H is your diagonal matrices. Uh, we are interest in, interested in looking at the adjoint action of H on G and cutting up G into eigenspaces. Okay, the eigenvalues are called roots. Or more precisely, these are no longer numbers. These are functionals on H. 
Okay, there's a finite collection of eigenvalues or roots. The killing form, which I introduced last time, that gives rise to a non-degenerate inner product on the real span of these roots, which I'll call V. Let's take a basis um, of uh, so-called simple roots, some extra conditions, but um, simple roots in particular are a basis of H star. And uh, I, I like introducing this dual basis because that way I could introduce this grading element in an efficient way later on. Okay, these ZIs. Uh, fundamental weights, I denote by lambda I. This is the usual definition in terms of the co-roots of the simple roots. This leads to the Cartan matrix. Uh, so that, that compresses the, the data of this G into this, uh, this matrix. For G2, this is just going to be a two by two matrix. Okay, satisfies some conditions. The Cartan matrix uh, in particular gives me a way to make a basis change between the simple roots and the fundamental weights. Okay, either using um, uh, Cartan matrix or the, the inverse. And one can compress this data even more into the, uh, the Dinkin diagram. So this is a graph with uh, each of these simple roots corresponding to some node. And then you have bonds between nodes I and J with a certain multiplicity, okay, uh, 0, 1, 2, or 3. And it's directed towards the shorter root if you have a bond of uh, either a double or triple bond. Parabolics we saw last time are encoded by uh, crosses on Dinkin diagrams. Okay, those crosses, they just give me a, a succinct way of, um, of uh, defining the grading element. Okay, so I just take the corresponding ZIs corresponding to where I put crosses. Um, I have uh, this inner product on V and this gives me some geometry. So associated to each root alpha, I have its perpendicular hyperplane. And I can take the reflection through that hyperplane given by the usual formula. Uh, these uh, reflections, uh, they generate a group and it's gonna be, they, they preserve the inner product. So you get a subgroup of the orthogonal group and it has some, you have some nice properties associated to this group. So the set of roots is W invariant, uh, W is finite and generated by simple reflections. And so any word in this vial group, uh, any element of this vial group is a word. Okay, so for instance, I'll use the notation one, two to be this composition of these simple reflections in this order. So S alpha two first, S alpha one afterwards. Okay, so we have some pictures here. Okay, so we, we went through most of this SL3 stuff last time. Okay, but this was, uh, th this is the data for G2. Okay, so here's our Dinkin diagram, cartel matrix. This is the highest weight or highest root. So that's the one corresponding at the top right here. Um, the, the parabolic relevant for 235, you put the cross over here, and this is the corresponding grading element, Z1. Okay, so for each of these roots here, so I have alpha 1 and alpha 2 displayed here. This would be alpha 1 plus alpha 2, 2 alpha 1 plus alpha 2, etc. Okay, so Z1 grades this to be positive 1. It grades this to be 0. So basically, and for, over here, so it grades... Um, this to be three. So I, I'm just interested in the coefficient of alpha one. I forget about this other coefficient. Okay, so this gives me a stratification, a grading of the Lie algebra for minus three to three. Okay, and that grading is respected by the Lie bracket. Other things you could say, the G zero level is important. So over here, this is, uh, so the Cartan subalgebra is two dimensional. And then I have these extra two dimensions over here. This is a copy of SL2 and then cross uh, C, so GL2, you can encode that from, or you extract that from this, uh, this Mark Dinkin diagram as follows. The dimension of the center is the number of crosses and the semi-simple part, you just omit the cross and you're left with a dot and that's the, the Dinkin diagram for SL2. For later use, I'm going to introduce these uh, root vectors. So EIJ refers to the root vector uh, for the root i alpha one plus j alpha two. So I'm just gonna pick off those coefficients and just, yeah. Th these are my raising operators in uh, SL2s. And these are my lowering operators, Fij's in those SL2s. In general, one can rescale. I mean, these are just eigenvectors, right? Um, the eigenspaces are one dimensional, each of them. 
um, one can rescale these. And I'm going to make a choice of using of normalizing those scalings to work in a so-called Chevrolet basis. So in particular, in this basis, it's nice in that the structure constants, they're all integers. Okay, so, but that's just a convenient choice. Okay, so Coxon theorem is gonna be on the next slide. I need one more ingredient. So how does the simple reflection S alpha J act on a weight expressed in terms of the fundamental weights? Okay, so these RIs are coefficients. In that, in that fundamental weight basis. A uh, little explanation here, probably more instructive is to just go through this diagrammatically. So here I'm doing reflections through the middle node, S alpha two, okay? So what do you do? Um, if you have a single bond, all you do is the following. You take that B uh, that on the node that in which you're reflecting, and then you transfer it, you add it to the adjacent nodes. So this becomes A plus B, and then B plus C, and then you flip this uh, coefficient over here. If you have multiplicity directed away from the node in which you're reflecting, then you carry that multiplicity over. So here you would have a 2B plus C. If the uh, arrow is directed into this node, you don't carry that multiplicity. It's just multiplicity one. Okay, so these are um, these are uh, some recipes that you could uh, you could show just using the, the definitions that I stated before. Okay, so, uh, so you can take a, an element of W expressed as a word in terms of the simple reflections, and then this describes its action on a weight. More important for a constant is the so-called affine W action. So one does this little intermediate step uh, beforehand. So I'm gonna define this rho vector. This is called the, uh, the lowest form. Okay. What is it diagrammatically? Uh, the coefficients in the fundamental weight basis are just ones. Okay, so what I do here is I take lambda expressed as some picture with some coefficients at the top. I add ones everywhere over each of the nodes. Then I'm, I do my W action. And then I do a subtraction afterwards. Okay, so that's the so-called affine W action. Affine by group action. Example, one, two, affine actingly, act, affinely acting on... Uh, on this weight over here. Okay, so what do I do? I, I add ones to each uh, node. So I get one, two. I'm gonna subtract that after the action. And then here is the action of the of S alpha two first. So I'm reflecting over here. That gets flipped to its negative. And then uh, with multiplicity, so two times three plus one gives me seven. Now I let S alpha one act. It flips this node to uh, be its negative. Okay, so seven goes to minus seven. Um, here, I just add seven to minus two and then I get five. And then I do a subtraction. Okay, so I get this weight, minus eight, four. So we, what we've just computed is that is this. Um, one, two acting on the weight lambda two is minus eight lambda one plus four lambda two. Using the cartel matrix, I could convert that from lambda notation to alpha notation. Okay, so this is the so-called inverse Cartel matrix. Okay, so one has these uh, diagrammatic rules here. Uh, how is this actually relevant to what I'm talking today? That's Costin's theorem. Okay, so this is a simplified version for G being complex simple and having highest weight lambda. It's the following. So the kth cohomology group is as a G0 module, a direct sum of a bunch of irreducible representations, irreducible uh, G0 representations. And uh, what Costin's theorem does is it describes the lowest weight for each of these irreducible representations. And this, uh, the number of irreducible representations is parameterized by a certain subset of the Vau group. Uh, Costin's theorem does more. It also gives you uh, explicit lowest weight vectors. And I'll explain the relevance of that later. Okay, but just my notation here. So V mu is the G0 irrep with lowest weight mu. Okay, these mu's being this minus W affine action on lambda, lambda being the highest weight. This subset uh, is called the Hasse diagram, and this, param uh, this parenthesis K refers to the length K words. The definition I'm not going to go through right now, I want to show you how to use it, because we're only interested in K is equal to 1 and K is equal to 2. So let me just state what those values are. Okay, so WP1 are words of length 1, where what is the uh, what is the word? So you just take, well, where you put the crosses. Okay, so if you just have a single cross, this 
set just consists of a single, single element. WP2 are words J, K, where J is a cross node. And K, it's either a cross node or the, the CJK non-zero tells me that um, K is connected to J in the Dinkin diagram. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll do the example for, for two, three, five, just to make this really concrete. Okay, so, um, so additionally, this explicit lowest weight vectors. So for, for, um, for H2, if you have an element looking like this in the Hasse diagram, Hasse subset, the lowest weight vector is, is a simple vector uh, produced from root vectors. But that's not so important right now on this slide. Okay, so so let's do two, three, five. Okay. Um, okay, this is my grading element. This is what uh, this first subset looks like. Okay, one because that's where you put the cross, and then WP two is one, two. Here are the relevant computations. Okay, this one we already did on the previous slide. This one using the same rules, you get uh, you get to this. How do you interpret this? Well, remember there's a negative over here. So I have to flip the sign of this weight. So it becomes this. Um, I'm interested in these gr the gradings of the corresponding uh, cohomology groups. So I want to convert from, from lambda notation to alpha notation. I do that using the Cartan matrix. And now I focus on this coefficient of alpha one because that's gonna be the grading associated to this. Okay, so here it's minus two. So the relevant cohomology group and the relevant gradings that I'm interested in are just the non-negative part, okay? And so I conclude that this is zero. And by what we had on Tanaka prolongation earlier on, when we were discussing Lie algebra cohomology, this tells me that the prolongation of the negative part is precisely G, okay? Um, in particular, this gives me a bound of the amount of symmetry that one has for all two, three, five structures. It's at most 14 dimensional. Okay, so, um, so G here being uh, G2. For uh, this second uh, cohomology group, okay, this is what we had. We have to flip the sign, so we get this. We convert it to alpha notation, so this becomes plus four alpha one, and this is telling me that the grading element acts with eigenvalue plus four. Okay, the degree or the homogeneity of this cohomology is four. Um, one can extract on top of this how the SL two, the, the semi-simple part of G zero, acts. And you just take this output, you remove the cross, this becomes the fourth fundamental represent, four, fourth representation for SL2. In other words, S4 of the standard representation. And it turns out it looks like this. Okay, so this is extremely nice because I mean, um, so this, so Costin's theorem was not available to Cartan at the time in 1910, but this is one way of getting at um, very quickly the structure of this harmonic curvature part extremely quickly. Okay, kappa H one deduces from this is is a binary quartic tensor. So this is called the Cartan quartic um, on this uh, two three five distribution D. Okay, so just as a little exercise, do this for the SL three P one two case for second order ODE, and so you you could recover those weights, those scaling weights, three and one and one and three that were used in the Cartan reduction method uh, uh, last time. Okay, so the only thing, if you haven't seen uh, all this weight stuff before, this is, probably, this is certainly way too fast. The only thing I want you to remember is this, okay? Plus four alpha one is the lowest weight of H2 that's relevant to us. And we're dealing with a binary quartic representation. Okay, so let's discuss algebraic models as filtered subdeformations. Okay, so we're we're interested. We're working in the category of Cartan geometries. What are the morphisms in this setting? So morphism is a principal p bundle morphism that pulls back one Cartan connection to the other. What does it mean for this geometry to be homogeneous? It's homogeneous if you have a Lie group. Uh, acting by such morphisms. So on this uh, Cartan geometry, um, and it induces a transitive action on M. So because these are principal P bundle morphisms, right? They map fibers to fibers. And so therefore it projects, these are projectable actions. Okay? You get an action down on M and you want that action to be transitive. Okay, so in this case, one could go further, right? I mean, you have, I think about, uh, 
a Lie group acting, this Lie group acting uh, from the left, this F, and then you have this right action um, by P moving up and down. Okay, so using both of them, you can get anywhere in the in the bundle. Okay, and um, one can show that this bundle in this case is equivalent to the following associated bundle um, over the quotient F mod F zero. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, instead of dealing with something uh, general like this, you could just think about this concretely. Um, there's a certain homomorphism that's used to define this associated bundle. Where does this come up? How does this come up naturally? Well, suppose I'm dealing with F0 as being the uh, isotropy of some point. Uh, I, chose, I chose some base point to be the origin. Okay, so it, you have this F0, any element there fixes this point, uh, but then the action is that that's down on M. Along the fibers, if I pick a point on that fiber, what it's doing is it's shuffling things. It's moving to another point in that same fiber, okay? And so the image values there, that, that generates this homomorphism, okay? So there are details here, of course, so I'll give you a reference, but um, just saying, you have a concrete model here. As usual with homogeneous geometries, things are determined by what's happening at a single point, okay? So, and any F invariant Cartan connection is determined from data at the single point by a linear map, um, use the same notation like I did last time, this var pi, from F to G. This is a linear map. It's not necessarily a Lie algebra homomorphism, okay, satisfying a few conditions. One is compatibility with this homomorphism here. So, that, so on the isotropy part, F0, it's just the differential. Uh, second condition is you have an equivariancy condition. Okay, not surprising. And third condition is a uh, transitivity condition. Okay, so omega, uh, var pi in, induces um, a linear isomorphism of f over f0 to g mod p, okay? So um, for details, I'll refer you to these uh, references here. This is, uh, this is quite standard. Um, a couple observations as far as using this. Okay, so if you differentiate C2 here, okay, so I take a curve in f0 and then differentiate it at the origin, you're gonna get to the corresponding infinitesimal statement. And uh, right, so this equality, if, if I take the difference, so the difference was introduced last time, it was this curvature, right? So, but the statement here is that I take this, uh, so I have this equality for all X in F0. So it's telling me that F0, this isotropy piece, it inserts trivially into curvature. If F0, the group is connected, then of course uh, C2 and C2 prime are, are equivalent. Another question you might ask is, okay, I have this linear map, is it uh, injective? Okay, so without loss of generality, it is, okay? If not, then, um, so this last condition tells you that the kernel is certainly contained in F0, and then this C2 prime will tell you that this kernel, if it's non-trivial, right, is a, is a non-trivial ideal, not just of F, but actually, not, not just of F0, but of F. Okay, so in this case, F mod F0 is not infinitesimally effective. Okay, so you have elements in there that basically are not visible by anything. You could just, uh, you could just always quotient by the kernel to get an equivalent description. Okay, so without less generally, this guy's injective. Well, let's identify F with its image under this bar pi. Okay, so that leads, uh, I'm gonna form this notion of algebraic model. Uh, just for convenience and just to axiomatize what it is we're actually trying to classify. Okay, so uh, G semi-simple P parabolic, you have this grading, um, you have this grading element. And I also introduced last time this um, canonical filtration generated by the grading. Okay, so G superscript I, you take the levels of the grading beyond, um, beyond I. One can also talk about it's associated graded, but um, because this filtration is generated from a grading, um, you can identify the associated graded as G zero modules with G. Okay, so this graded part, uh, this associated graded at level I, what does it do concretely? If I have say an X in the filtrand GI, I could write it as, uh, in terms of the graded buckets as, okay, XI plus higher order stuff. Okay, so this GRI just says, send X to the leading part, XI. 
Okay, but I have this uh, filtration. Okay, so what's my notion of algebraic model that I'll introduce? So an algebraic model is a Lie algebra such that three axioms. One, it's a filtered subspace. Okay, so I induce the filtration on any subspace just from the one I have on this ambient G. Okay, just take the intersection with F itself okay, to get these filtrans Fi. And then I could take its associated graded. Okay, and of course I want that transitivity assumption. So I want the negative part to be full. So S minus is equal to G minus. Okay, so in other words, this encodes what was on the previous slide. F mod F zero is G mod P. Second axiom. Uh, F0 inserts trivially into what I define as curvature. So the curvature just being the difference between these brackets. So in this way, um, so kappa is an element over here, but by what I had in M1, this is the same thing. I can identify that with this space over here. The nice thing about, I, uh, and I'll use the same notation for, for both. Okay? So the nice thing about working this space is I know what uh, regular and normal means. And that's the last uh, axiom that I'm putting in here. So this is for the parabolic set, okay? So that's my notion of algebraic model. That's what we wanna classify here. Okay, so a uh, couple observations um, before we apply this. So given G and P, so th that's fixed, let M be the set of all algebraic models. First of all, it's a partially ordered set, okay? So if I have F, I'm gonna define it to be less than or equal to F prime if I have a Lie algebra injection from F to F prime, okay? So, um, so you can think about this as, so F, F being not, not the optimal presentation where you have all symmetries uh, present, okay? You have in principle more symmetries. Um, second is that it admits a P action, okay? Just take F and let P act on it, okay? And this is not surprising, right? Because on the previous slide, Everything's determined by data from a single point. If I move up and down the fiber, everything just transforms in a nice way equivariantly. And so I just get corresponding data that's transformed equivariantly. Okay, so those, this, um, so algebraic models in the same P orbit should be regarded as equivalent. Okay, but we could use this as a means to classify. So of course, this, if I just state it with this definition, um, it takes still some work to, to actually put this into practice, okay? There are various uh, necessary constraints that I wanna point out that, one, that helps one in doing this classification problem phrased in this language. Okay, so some necessary constraints. Okay, so I introduced Tanaka prolongation. Um, that was really what I refer as the, an intrinsic version of Tanaka prolongation. Um, abstract version of Tanaka prolongation. Let me talk about uh, what I like to refer to as the an extrinsic Tanaka prolongation or embedded Tanaka prolongation, where I'm working within the context already of an ambient graded Lie algebra. Okay, so let G be a graded Lie algebra with G minus one generating G minus. If I have phi in a G zero representation, in particular H two, second cohomology, let A this denoted also a phi be the graded Lie subalgebra uh, whose non-negative part is, um, sorry, non-positive part is G minus and the annihilator of phi. And then I'm going to uh, extend this data uh, as much as possible um, into a graded Lie algebra. Okay, so how do I do this? I take elements at level K and bracket with everything in G minus one and require that to be in the previous level. Okay, so here everything's defined up to A0. I generate A1 using this formula, and then I iteratively generate the entire uh, parts on the entire parts on the positive side. Okay, so it's, it's a way of propagating the given data, G minus annihilator, uh, to the entire uh, positive side. Okay, so what can I do? Okay, so let's let F uh, GP be an algebraic model. Here are some constraints that one wants to take into account. Okay, first of all, um, I said it's a filtered subspace before, but it's actually a filtered Lie algebra. So the, the bracket pres uh, 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 preserves the filtrans. Okay, so you Fi bracket Fj, you land in Fi plus J. Then I can take its associated graded. 
And in this case, this becomes a graded Lie subalgebra of G. Further constraints. Uh, the, we saw that F0 inserts trivially into kappa, but actually it also acts trivially on kappa. Okay. Um, this is regarded as a well, two cochain. Okay. So you have this uh, usual formula for how the action is, where the Z uh, is coming from F0. Uh, and thirdly, and very importantly, is this last condition that the associated graded of F, this S, it's a subspace. Um, a graded subspace of uh, this A kappa H, this Tanaka prolongation. Okay, so this is what I alluded to, this F being a filtered subdeformation of this Tanaka prolongation. So because it, in general might be a subspace. Okay, so um, these are not difficult to prove. Uh, the, uh, the first one, for instance, so Fi is this intersection. Um, remember that the bracket F, the F bracket is the G bracket deformed by curvature. Okay. Um, the G bracket uh, preserves the filtration. So this is okay um, with the G bracket. The, the curvature term, so regularity tells me that uh, if I insert something at, at filtran I and, and J, Fi and Fj, it goes to F uh, I plus J plus one. So it's even higher up in the filtration. Okay, so you could suck it up into this uh, into this filtran. Okay, so you get this nice condition, and that gives you uh, this condition on on S. The second one just comes from the Jacobi identity. Okay, so that's just a small check. Uh, what about the last one? Del star is p equivariant, so uh, the image of del star is a p invariant subspace. So um, uh, Right, from the second statement, you get to the statement about annihilating harmonic curvature. And then since the G plus action on, um, on either homology or cohomology is trivial, right? This is a completely reducible representation that was mentioned last time. Then this descends to this statement, S zero uh, annihilates harmonic curvature. So, um, for the positive parts, what can we say? So we're just evaluating this, this Tanaka prolongation condition over here. Let's take that what's le at level K, bracket with everything in G minus one, but for homogeneous structures, G minus one is the same thing as S minus one, and S is a graded Lie algebra. So this certainly lands in S K minus one. Okay, so if we're working with the Tanaka prolongation associated to annihilating the harmonic curvature, uh, what this shows at level zero is that uh, that S zero is is in the annihilator, and then you just inductively propagate this all the way up. Okay, so uh, so this is uh, this is a statement that's in the algebraic setting here. There there are certainly generalizations of this, and I'll mention this a little bit later. Okay, but let's actually apply this. Okay, so. We're in the setting of, uh, so G is the algebra of G2. And so this gives me a three grading with respect to the chosen parabolic that I indicated before. Uh, remember that bit I told you to uh, remember. So H2 uh, looks like this. Okay, it's homogeneity or degree four. The lowest weight is four alpha one. And I have a binary quartic representation. And so just abstractly speaking, uh, if I take this to be the standard basis for the standard um, SL2 representation, uh, my weight vectors basically look like this, okay? So, uh, right, it's a dimension five. And um, yeah, my lowest weight vector is this, uh, this quantity over here with, with, with a quadruple root. Okay, so if I have any elements in this, the span here, so in this space, right, this phi, this, uh, I could take its annihilator and start propagating that Tanaka prolongation all the way up. Uh, a nice uh, fact is that as soon as you pick a non-zero element from here, then actually you don't get into positive prolongation. All those positive parts, they're always trivial. Okay, so this was observed um, and proven in, in, in much greater generality in my paper with Boris Kuzmikov in 2014. And so this property that, 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 that we have, that I stated right here, we refer to it as prolongation rigidity. So just a warning, not all G mod P's are prolongation rigid. 
So for example, the, the simplest example where you, you do get into positive prolongation is uh, A3 mod P12. So corresponding to um, system of second order ODs. So pa pairs of second order ODs. Um, I think maybe in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this proof right here, okay, but this is just doing it explicitly for, for one of the cases, okay, but just um, how do I actually use this fact, okay, so I don't get into pro positive prolongation, okay, remember that, so, okay, so let's go to root types now for Cartan's cortic, so any binary, binary cortic is, it can be classified by its root type, one can normalize such cortex using the GL2 action. Okay, so you, of course, you have the flat case type O, so when phi is just zero, but then you have uh, quadruple root, triple root, double root, um, and then more generic types. Okay, so you do the, the, the computation here. Okay, so remember that uh, this had weight four alpha one. If you look at the annihilator, Z2 certainly annihilates four alpha one, so this is in there. But also, this being the lowest weight, uh, if you apply the lowering any lowering operator here, then that kills it. Okay, so the annihilator is two dimensional in this case. Uh, do the computation for these guys. So remember, this weight is four alpha one, and then plus a raising operator, so four alpha one plus alpha two. So that's if you take the annihilator, you you get this element popping in there. Uh, and then similarly, you have uh, this one over here. Uh, these guys are trivial. Where that statement on the previous slide comes in, so identifying that you do not get into positive prolongation. So the dimension here of this Tanaka prolongation is just the negative part, which is five dimensional, plus the annihilator. So in this case, it's two, one, one. So these are the dimensions that result. Okay, but remember, S is contained in the Tanaka prolongation of the harmonic curvature. So particularly here. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, yeah, uh, I should have a square over there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. Okay, um, so this constraint here tells you that uh, these dimensions give upper bounds on each of the different types. Okay, in particular for, for 235, if you're, if you're homogeneous, then the maximum would be seven if you're non-flat. But also we observed that multiply transitive models, so those with isotropy, can potentially only exist in types N, three, or D. Okay. Uh, just a, a footnote here. So the submaximal symmetry dimension S is equal to seven. This was shown by Carton in his 1910 paper. Um, basically locally constant type is assumed in his calculations because he's doing bundle reductions. Okay, and in this paper with Boris, we, we, we didn't put any assumptions here. Okay, we had a, a different argument. This, this, um, this statement S uh, is contained to Tanaka prolongation of the harmonic curvature part. You could actually, uh, so we proved a statement in this paper as well as a follow-up paper, a stronger version in the follow-up paper where basically you have a point-wise version of this. So, so as, for, example, for instance, if you're dealing with an inhomogeneous structure that you know at one point is uh, type N, then, uh, then you automatically get this constraint of seven for the entire structure, okay? So point-wise constraint. Okay, so, uh, so what I want you to remember from this section is just that the, these models, multiply transitive, can only exist in uh, type N, three, or D. Okay, so let's put this into practice now. How does one go about uh, classifying? Uh, so here, yeah, I'll use the, the starting point is the fundamental theorem of parabolic geometries. So we're working with regular normal Cartan geometries of type this type. Let's look at the type three case. Okay, so we saw six is the maximum, but actually it's not realizable. There are no multiply transitive type three models. Okay, so we gave uh, an efficient proof that avoids Cartan reduction in this 2014 paper. So uh, here's our proof with just ma minor modifications in, in language here, but um, it's basically the same. So let's assume that uh, we have an algebraic model of type three and assume that you're multiply transitive. So you have some isotropy. Okay, so the first thing you do is you, uh, you try to normalize harmonic curvature. Okay, so I'm gonna 
use G0, so this GL2 action to normalize it to just this element that I chose on the previous slide, uh, xy cubed. And this has weight for alpha 1 plus alpha 2. OK, so let's look at things at the graded level first. OK, so the graded level, this Tanaka prolongation, it consists of the negative part as well as this zero part. OK, so the negative part, these were my root vectors that I introduced way back earlier in the, in the talk. And then here is the element that annihilates uh, this vector with weight like this. OK, so z1 extracts the value 4, but then I subtract um, 1 times OK, so this, is, this annihilates. OK, so uh, that's what's happening at the graded level. Let's take an element um, whose associated graded is, say, this one. We're going to focus on this guy in isotropy. right? And we're going to do some normalizations using this freedom of using the, the p action. Okay? And we're going to find that actually instead of just working at the, grade, the graded level, we could assume that this actually lies in the symmetry algebra. Okay, so how do we do this? OK, so the basis on G plus are these guys right here. And first thing, you take that, uh, that, uh, that element in the isotropy, which acts nice and diagonalizably, and let's look at its eigenvalues. So you do the calculation, and you find the following eigenvalues, all being distinct. So. Let's take a guy actually in the symmetry algebra. Right? Here, this is just at the associated graded level. Okay, so let's take an element in the symmetry algebra in the isotropy uh, whose leading part is t. In other words, this guy looks like leading part t plus all this stuff in positive grading for some undetermined coefficients. But now we just use the p action to just get rid of these uh, coefficients. Okay, so take uh, exp t. E10. Okay, take the adjoint action there. Uh, by the usual formula, this is the same thing as exp t little add. And then I use the uh, corresponding exponential series. Okay, and so what I notice is that, well, so this t tilde has this c10 e10 there. So that's the leading part here is t plus c10 e10. But if I bracket uh, e10 with this guy, Okay. I'm going to use the eigenvalue here. Okay. So I haven't specified what t is, the little t is. Okay. But if I choose little t to be c10, I could get rid of this coefficient. Okay. Now just relabeling f, okay, as, uh, yeah, so just relabeling f, then I could get, I, I could, what if I, effectively what I've done is I've normalized this coefficient to zero. And then I just do that for the remaining ones to get rid of um, uh, all of this tail. Important here is that these eigenvalues are non-zero. Okay. So continuing this way, we, we may assume that T is actually in the symmetry algebra, not just at the associated graded level. Uh, another way of, of viewing this, that effectively the, exactly the same thing, is to observe that no multiple of four alpha one plus alpha two is contained in the roots of G plus, okay? That would be an exceptional uh, weight because that's annihilated by, by T, right? So that would give a zero eigenvalue, okay? But this weight is not in there. So I have non-zero eigenvalues as we see up here. Okay, so summary of this computation, T is in F zero. We have a nice semi-simple element that's in there. Step number two, we show that cap is equal to zero. Uh, with respect to this basis, okay, on the negative part, uh, so I, I just have the negatives of those eigenvalues that I had on the previous slide. Uh, again, let's take corresponding, let's take some elements in the symmetry algebra um, whose associated graded give these corresponding uh, leading, ha have these corresponding leading parts, okay? Um, taking some linear combinations, I could always arrange so that in this basis here, this guy just acts diagonalizably. Okay? This is because these eigenvalues are all distinct. Okay? So add t, modifying this as appropriate. This is, this is adapted to the filtration. Uh, the add action looks like this, all distinct eigenvalues. Okay? Now this bracket, this f bracket, is add t equivariant. 
So rescaling basis elements, if necessary, the only non-trivial brackets, aside from these uh, ones just coming from the action of T, which I know agree with the action, uh, with, with the bracket on the ambient G, right? Because kappa with T inserted is zero, you get the following possibility. Okay, so just, um, just to give you a hint of, of where these extra parameters come from. X1, right, has eigenvalue minus one. X4 has eigenvalue one. The sum of those eigenvalues is zero. And the only possibility here where you have eigenvalue zero is just T. Okay, so this is, um, I have to insert a parameter here, of course. So over here, X3, so one, two, three, so two, X5, is uh, five, uh, one sec. Sorry. So I think I might've stated this wrong here. Sorry, two. This should be four. Yeah, this should be four. So two, one, and then uh, three. Sorry about that. Okay, so, so the Lie algebra F, this is what it has to look like. Now apply Jacobi, and that kills these two parameters, A and B. Okay, so the, um, now the difference between, uh, between kappa, uh, between the, the brackets, uh, the F bracket and the, 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 the ambient bracket, so that's curvature. So what we've shown is just kappa is equal to zero. Okay, in other words, harmonic curvature is zero. So this gives a contradiction, okay? It's not type three. So no type three multiply transitive structures can exist. Okay, so that's, uh, that's some ideas about this type three case. What about type N? Okay, so- um, uh, Dennis, may I ask you something? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, Cartan proved a stronger statement uh, that uh, there is no, Two, three, five distribution with this constant Cartan tensor of type what you call type three. So roots one of velocity three, one of velocity one. Of course, the statement implies that there are no homogeneous distribution of this Cartan tensor of this type. But Cartan proves stronger statement. That equation. So it is a very your, your method, your method with Borja Krugnikov uh, allows yeah. to prove this stronger statement or only restricted to homogeneous. No, actually, so uh, we had difficulty showing the stronger statement that there's no homogeneous. So, so you, you could, so we've eliminated the topmost possibility, six. Okay, one could ask, can you, can, a five, can you have a simply transitive model? So a five dimensional type three model, okay? And, um, and using our methods, getting to that is, is, not, is not easy. Okay, so, uh, so one can attack it using Cartan reduction. This, this was pointed out if you look in our paper, um, so there's a short footnote there that, well, Robert, uh, after he saw our paper, he, he went and investigated it using Cartan reduction. It, it's a lot of work. I mean, there's, the, he, so you hit the, um, the dimension of the manifold. There's a lot of, I think he ended up with like 12 branches. Each branch, you get, you, you get to a contradiction, okay? But they're, they're quite nasty algebraic equations. So uh, you do not know Alternative proof. Uh, well, not, I not Cartan's I proof know, a stronger statement. I don't know about your statement that, like, in in, in you say that Cartan proved it. I mean, the the, the type three section is very short. I'm I'm a little bit doubtful that he proved the stronger ah, statement. So you you doubt that Cartan proved uh, that there is no uh, two three five distribution with this constant uh, Cartan tensor of type if, three. If, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, that you're saying you're saying that that um that you cannot have it even on in the simply transitive case. No, yeah, that's I understand. Uh, so I think I think we should But uh, we should condition that Cartan no. tensor is stronger is much softer. No, what, what much, I not much it is softer than condition that distribution is homogeneous. What I understand of what Michal is trying to say is that probably Cartan was able to understand the branches of differential invariance, which creates some bifurcation which is related to differential invariance, which is what we've done. Uh, like Dennis is showing something which I do not really understand in depth as, as he does. 
But it's, what Michal is saying is that probably Qatar really understood the branches of what is coming, the environment in coming, the problem. I, I, don't, I don't doubt that. I mean, but I mean, the, as far as the it details, should be the, the purely algebraic, the algebraic method, you probably don't 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 get this information. This is what you want to say, isn't it? Well, as far as the details that are shown in Carton for for this, the simply. But I also yes, I, I, did not I'm unsure. Good details. I'm sure, but That's I mean, what you say. Yes. Okay. I understand. It. So, uh, this, so this, was, this, 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 this was just a warm-up exercise. So to, again, uh, okay. okay. Dennis, again, to clarify, yeah. is the theorem that there is no 235 distribution with constant Cartan tensor of type three, is it true? I'm interpreting that, as I said, as the, like, uh, so you cannot, so a, a homogeneous, you, you do not have homogeneous type three models. That's no, no, I forget about homogeneous. What I said is true that there is no 235 distribution with constant Cartan tensor of type three. So tell, you, tell me what you mean by constant Cartan tensor then. Which doesn't change from point to point. Yeah. So, so just type three. Just type three. No, but I think behind, no, you, you behind this question. In, sorry, you no. can have in homogeneous type three, two, three, fives. Absolutely. You can no, no, I'm not speaking about homogeneous. I, I, are, I, neither am I. Any, any homogeneous has constant Cartan tensor, but not no, any but with constant Cartan tensor is homogeneous. You can have in homogeneous uh, models that are, that are type three everywhere. That's certainly possible. No, you proved that it's impossible in Cartan. No, no, no. I'm, I'm working in the homogeneous setting here. Huh? I'm working in the homogeneous setting. In homogeneous case, it's impossible. It's to impossible. Have Cartan tensor of right three. Yes. But you can is, have. Is it true? Homogeneous. Is it true? A stronger statement that uh, it's impossible uh, to have cons for any two three five distribution to have constant type three at any point. You can have models that are type three everywhere. You can? Yes, but they, they're necessarily not homogeneous. But, uh, so you know example of a two, three, five distribution, not homogeneous, which has at any point, we have a Cartan tensor of type, of, it, of type three. In our, in our paper with Boris, we have a model with four symmetries. That's type oh, three. Okay, okay. In our problem? paper with Boris, we have a two, three, five distribution that's type three with four symmetries. Okay, you have this four symmetries, right? Okay, uh, so not homogeneous, but constant type three, right? Yes. Okay, that's what my question you will just okay. answer. So excellent. <laughs> so uh, tell me, what is this paper? Uh, your, your paper is publicable. Uh, it's called the gap phenomenon in parabolic. In what in what journal it published? Uh, Krell. Krell. Yeah. Okay. Two thousand fourteen. Yeah. Good. I, about this quartic, I have another question. Sure. Because what, uh, as far as I understand, what are differential invariants in other subjects, not in Carton papers? This I don't master. But in principle, it is just a starting point because the other four. Uh, or I don't know which is the order, but this quartic is just a starting when you encounter the first relative differential invariance. Yes. And then you have to branch to, to dis yes. discuss whether something is... So we didn't never discuss together with Dennis about that, but I want somehow to say that as far as I understand in other topics, you have higher order differential invariance, which are created by branchings. So in principle, it's just not enough. The information from the cortex is not enough. Absolutely. Uh, you agree with this? Okay. So Absolutely. perfect. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, no, these, are, these are just first. I just want to get warmed up here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. So uh, let's focus on type n. Okay. So uh, type three was uh, you know killing off that branch in in relatively quick way. Okay. Using just this eigenvalue uh, type arguments. Well, let's look at type n. Okay, again, we're just uh, focusing on the, the homogeneous setting, uh, multiply transitive setting, even more. Okay, we saw that seven was an upper bound. So if you're multiply transitive, it's either going to be six or seven. 
Okay, so the N7 case, okay, these are all the well-known models, okay? Um, and so corresponding to two, three, five distributions. Um, uh, and then this is one exceptional model. Okay, so these all fit into this N7 family. Okay, so, um, and I'll refer to Cartan or uh, this paper of Boris Dubrov and Boris Kukukov in 2014 for more discussion on this. The N6 case, this was that uh, case that Cartan missed. Um, this is the so-called so Dubrov-Govorov model uh, discovered in 2013. Okay, so here we're, we're going to just focus on the N7 case. And so via his reduction method, Cartan arrives at the following structure equations. And he also gave embedding data. Uh, so I'll refer to what I mean there but, uh, in lecture two. Okay, but uh, the issue one may have with this is, well, the Cartan connection is not a Cartan connection. So let's find the Cartan theoretic description associated to this. Okay, so let me give you the statement. Um, so first of all, we start as before. So use the G0 action, normalize the harmonic curvature to be just this lowest weight y to the power four, lowest weight vector. Um, and this weight, remember, was plus four alpha one. You take the corresponding, so I'm in the N7 case. So when I'm realizing, so I don't have just an inclusion, but actually equality here, okay? Because this thing is already seven dimensional. Okay, this negative part is, is um, these root vectors that I had before. And then you have the zero part. So this Z2 and this lowering operator F01. Okay, so here's a statement. Any N7 algebraic model is P equivalent. So P being you, it's uh, right, GL2 and then semi-direct exponential of the positive part. Um, so this guy's P equivalent. Uh, to one of the models that I'm going to give below. Okay, there's a parameter. There's a parameter C that appears in the model, but in terms of actually classifying these models, uh, one wants to work with the essential invariant C squared. Okay, so C and minus C give the same models. Okay, so what's nice is that it's just a slight deformation of the graded. Okay, so you have these guys being the leading parts, okay, that you see over here. But then there's this deformation of F10 into the E10 direction, okay, given by this parameter. Curvature is extremely simple still. It's just this harmonic curvature that uh, one can obtain from constant, okay? So this is one of the useful things about constant, getting you quickly to um, a harmonic, uh, well, I guess earlier I stated in terms of two chains, I could convert that using the killing form to two cochain. And so it would look like this. Okay, so this tells you how to de deform the brackets. And so one can induce, in, induce what the Lie algebra structure, and it looks like this, okay? But this is embedding data, right? That's uh, together with the curvature gives me the Lie algebra structure, okay? But this is a Cartan theoretic description. Uh, I'll give you some details here, um, okay? So how this works. Okay, one begins basically as before. Okay, so, but yeah, you start with what's in the zero part. Okay, so you take S and N. Okay, uh, this is a semi simple element, this is a nilpotent element. Okay. Um, okay, whose associated graded or leading parts are the given ones, okay, at the graded level. And then one tries to use P to normalize. Okay. I'm going to focus first on, on S. That's a nice diagonalizable element. Okay. So um, one tries to use P to normalize the tails as much as possible, but one finds that you can't, you can't get rid of these tails uh, just using that, that action. Uh, why? Because you get a zero eigenvalue. Okay. Z2 on E10 is just zero. Okay. So what this reduces uh, P to um, or reduces P, the P plus part, that's what I'm using to do the normalization as I did before using the adjoint action. It reduces it down to this exponential of just this one dimensional guy, G alpha one, this root space. Okay, but um, let's start, well, taking, uh, taking other, well, forming a, a filtered, a, adapted filtered basis. Okay, so let's take X at level uh, minus one with leading part F one zero. Um, using uh, linear combinations or, or this, this residual part of structure group, one can get to this form, okay? Um, 
let me not go through all the details, but just kind of give you an outline so you get a feel for how this works, okay? So use SNN, and uh, use this bit of structure group, and we're gonna remove some of these higher bits and you could actually get into this form, okay? Plus some higher tails, okay? Why am I doing that? Well, I'm gonna, I mean, I have this extra bit of deformation. It's not so nice. I wanna, I wanna try to get rid of it. Let's start forming commutators. So let's take the bracket of S with X, okay? S being in the zero level, right? Remember the zero level, um, the curvature is zero on with a zero level element inserted. So this F bracket is the same thing as this G bracket. Okay, and one finds this expression right here. But if one looks at this expression over here, okay, H10 looks like this. E01 is the raising operator. This is all at zero level. This is higher level stuff. But here, right? These are linearly independent from these guys. So that tells me that if you, this is gonna be closed as a Lie algebra, A and B have to be zero. Okay, and then that's nice because then I don't have this higher tail here. I have this nice semi-simple element. Okay, so that was the argument I just said right here. So S looks like this. Uh, X in general is just gonna look like this. Okay, you still have this deformation. Okay, what about general deformation tails? Okay, so let's take uh, this leading part F. Let's take an X. This guy is all, all inside F, frac F. Okay, and then let's start using again this semi simple element. Take the commutator, it looks like this. You can have a leading part like this plus a bit like this. Um, okay, so, so if this leading part is uh, non zero, one can show that this, um, this tail part has to look like this, okay? It, it's, it's, so, so the tail is, is defined as like, you have this leading part and then you're, you're so the, the tail is delta, this, this function of the leading part. Okay, so I'm basically writing the tail as a graph. Okay, so this, uh, this tail part satisfies this nice condition. In other words, it's telling me that this, this function is S invariant. And this puts a heavy constraint on what sort of tails can exist, okay? So um, in particular, one can do an analysis using weights, okay? Namely, this guy is an H module and all weights are non-negative. What is the weight of interest? It's the weight that's being annihilated by Z2, okay? In, in other words, multiples of alpha one. If you analyze over here, can I have any multiples of alpha one? There are only two possibilities, namely this vector and this vector. This vector we've already killed. That was this bit over here. And we show that A has to be zero. But this piece corresponding to C is a tail that can exist. Okay, so, so we normalize the embedding as best as we can. What about curvature? Okay, so remember curvature is annihilated by F zero. So Z2 annihilates it. And then you use a couple of facts about, that come from parabolic geometries. Uh, namely the lowest degree part of the curvature is harmonic. You remember the lowest degree part is um, degree four. So you have four and higher order stuff. Uh, it's also a torsion free geometry. Okay, so Kappa has to look like something in this subspace. Okay, and again, this becomes a weight, uh, a bit of weight analysis. Okay, what you're looking for are these exceptional weights, multiples of alpha one. Okay, so in level four, the only thing is this, uh, this lowest weight vector looking like this. In level five and higher, well, I can write out the, the weight I'm interested in as a sum of weights, okay, right? Because it's an element that looks like this, okay? So it's gonna be the sum of alpha, alpha plus beta plus gamma, where these are roots for G, in G plus, and then this is some weight, um, some root inside P, also possibly the zero weight. Now, if all of these are, well, if, sorry, if gamma is non-negative, well, that forces alpha and beta to be multiples of alpha one, but that's impossible because these, I'm, I'm working inside of a two cochain space. So that leads to a contradiction. Um, you can analyze the other case as well. Uh, so if you're negative, there's only one negative root there that's negative alpha two. 
you're in grading five or higher. So that forces the sum of these guys to be um, at least five. And um, so this forces alpha and beta to be in non-negative, uh, in grading at least two, both of them. These look like this. And so therefore, Z2, the grading on these guys, is at, at least two. So therefore, the, uh, the value in the direction of alpha 2 is at least 1. But I'm interested in only multiples of alpha 1. So this is telling me I have some component in the alpha 2 direction. And so that gives a contradiction. Okay, so this is not very difficult, but it's, it's, it's more just uh, getting used to working with weights and roots and eigenvalues and such like that. Okay, so um, that's, that's one way of getting to this theorem that I stated on the previous slide. Okay, Cartan theoretic description. Okay, lastly, what about type D? Okay, so Cartan, he classified type D models over C, and by our early calculation, all type D homogeneous structures have symmetry at most six. Okay, so list over R, so this was uh, studied by, this was obtained by Travis Wilsey in 2019. He, he basically took the, the complex list and classified all compatible anti-involutions there. And uh, the fixed point sets give you, fixed point set gives you this real list. And it contains many interesting distributions, including those describing rolling without twisting or slipping, um, involving surfaces of constant curvature. So the two sphere, Euclidean plane and hyperbolic plane. And so I mentioned this theorem in my first lecture, this uh, remarkable fact um, that uh, well, if you consider two two spheres in R3 with ratio of radii rho being greater than one, let M be the configuration space of their rolling on each other without twisting or slipping, and let D rho be the symmetry algebra. So it's a remarkable fact that when rho is not equal to three, then you get six dimensional symmetry, SO3, SO3, as to be expected, because I mean, you have two, two spheres, right? So SO3 uh, rotations on each. So that's the expected, um, but when rho is equal to three, it jumps up to 14. Okay, so the origins trace back to uh, some unpublished uh, work or remark of Bryant. Uh, Igor Zelenko was probably the first to prove this in his paper in 2006, followed by um, uh, Bohr Montgomery in 2009, and lastly looked at by uh, John Baez and John Huerta in 2014. A few more words about the origins here of the three to one ratio. So in their paper uh, in 2014, so they, they remarked that, so G2, the Lie group actually doesn't act on uh, this rolling um, configuration space. It's actually a double cover that you have to pass to. And so it's best viewed uh, in terms of a rolling spinner on a projected plane and via incidence geometry of G2. Uh, Igor Zelenko's work, so in 2006, he computed the Cartan quartic via his theory of abnormal extremals, and he found that this vanishes when rho is equal to three. Okay, so harmonic curvature uh, is zero, um, it's flat. Okay, so even though, um, so the symmetry jumps up to, to 14. In Bohr Montgomery's paper in 2009, so they presented Lee theoretic data and embedding in the rho is equal to three case into the split real form of G2. Um, I'll just take a couple extracts from their paper here. So they said, this theorem was communicated to us by Robert Bryant, for whom it is in essence contained in Elie Cartan's uh, notoriously difficult five variables paper of 1910. Robert Bryant wrote to us, Cartan himself gave a geometric description of the flat G2 structure as the differential system that describes space curves of constant torsion two or a half in the standard unit three sphere. See the concluding remarks in section 53. Uh, paragraph 11 in the five variables paper. One can easily transform the rolling balls problem for arbitrary ratios of radii into the problem of curves in the three sphere of constant torsion. And in this guise, one can recover the three to one or one of three ratio as Cartan's torsion two or a half with a minimum of fuss. Thus one could say that Cartan's calculation essentially covers the rolling ball case. So if you look at Cartan, this is what he says. I'll just translate it. Uh, in the case that your torsion is two or a half, the system admits a 14 parameter group. In the other cases, it admits a six parameter group of uh, motions of the uh, space considered. So let's have a look at the Lee theoretic description uh, provided by Bohr Montgomery, 2009. 
So they gave uh, Lee theoretic data and they showed this um, embedding uh, when, when rho is equal to three. Okay, so what, what is their description? So uh, let SO3, I'm gonna identify that with R3 with usual cross product. Okay, take the basis i, j, and k with the following commutator relations. And then on uh, this Lie algebra f, uh, so SO3, uh, two copies of SO3. So this is six dimensional. I wanna specify uh, five dimensional geometry. So I have to give a one dimensional isotropy. So that's this kk. Now for any row, uh, could be negative even. Let's define the following uh, subspace, uh, so f minus one, okay? So uh, when you quotient f minus one by f zero, you get to uh, a two-dimensional subspace that's modeling our rank two distribution. And this is f zero invariant, okay? But let's notice some discrete symmetries. If we swap the SO3 factors, okay? And then rescale to get to the generator in this form, that induces uh, an involution on the parameter level. So rho going to one of a row. Also, there's uh, two involutions of SO3 that I give right here. Using one on each SO3 factor induces a flip of the parameter. Okay, so, so I don't need to consider negative rho and, and I of course can induce this flip so that uh, you, could, uh, you could assume that rho is greater than or equal to one. Rho is equal to one, you don't need to consider that case because in this case, you do not get to a two, three, five. F minus one level gives you a subalgebra. Okay, so rho greater than one suffices. Okay, so, um, so you, starting with this F minus one, you generate the corresponding weak derived flag. And then you could get the corresponding adapted basis. Here's the zero level. Uh, these two lie in minus one. This is level minus two and these fill it up to minus three. Okay, so that's the Lee theoretic description. So what I wanna do now is give you uh, an outline at least of a Cartan theoretic proof of exceptionality of the three to one ratio. Okay, so here's a theorem. The, the key to this is to, ex to go a bit beyond, well, go beyond uh, rolling balls and, and do the classification for arbitrary D6 models. Okay, so you get to the following using techniques like what I've shown. Any D6 algebraic model is P equivalent to one of the following given below. I have two parameters here, but one of them is, is not so essential, okay? So these are gonna be classified by this invariant. And uh, yeah, in the D6 case, B is gonna be non-zero. So I could always uh, normalize this to B is equal to one. I'm keeping it in there because I wanna find the three to one ratio. So here is the embedding. As you can see, it's, it's more complicated than the, than the embeddings that we had in the type N case. You, these leading parts are given right here, but you always in general have some deformation, some tails, okay? Um, curvature is much more complicated, <coughs> and, uh, right? So this kappa four piece, that's just the harmonic part, okay? But there are higher parts um, in, in degree six and degree eight uh, that arise. And these guys you could show, as you expect, the, uh, right, these lie in the image of del star, so acting on three co-chains, three chains. Okay, so you could show that these lie in the image of del star. When you quotient kappa by the image of del star, you get to the harmonic part, which is the lowest part. Okay, notice this parameter B that pops here, pops up here. When B is equal to zero, that's precisely characterizing when you're flat. Okay, all right. So, I mean, th this is, yeah, this is a statement for, uh, for D6, but these, these are valid structural equations even when B is non-zero, when B is equal to zero. Okay, and this is the corresponding Lie algebra structure that results when you use this embedding and this kappa. Okay. What I wanna point out here is to focus, as I've done before, on this element, this nice semi-simple element lying in isotropy at level zero, okay? What are the eigenvalues? Zero, one, minus one, zero, one, minus one. Okay, so you have double eigenvalues for each of zero, one, minus one. Okay, so how does this uh, Cartan theoretic proof work? Let's take uh, the, the Bohr Montgomery description and then let's complexify. This has a filtration, so this induces a filtration over here. And so the goal here now is to match it with the D6 equations. 
it has to be there, right? If the, the theorem is true that I stated before, uh, right? It has to have some realization in terms of uh, this Cartan theoretic description. And the key is to look at these eigenvalues. So you have these double eigenvalues, zero plus or minus one. If you look at, t, at this T tilde, right? This T tilde, right? It was uh, this guy over here, right? Here it's an SO3 language. So you're gonna have some complex eigenvalues popping up. So you have double eigenvalues, zero plus or minus I. So if you wanna try to match this, let's apply an, a multiplication by I. And then, uh, what one, one tries to do is try to, what one can try to do is uh, find the most general filtration adapted add T eigenbasis extending this element over here. Okay, so um, to get into the nice form, nice diagonal form, one should use these elements over here. Okay, um, over here, so this has zero eigenvalue. This also has zero eigenvalue. And so this one in general has to account for not just what's happening at the leading part, but some deformation into some higher tail. Okay, so one has to add some extra parameter over here. Then similar arguments to get to this form over here. So the, ex, the tilde guys are what's coming from the, um, the Bohr Montgomery description. The X's are what's coming in this nice um, algebraic model description. Okay, so if you're gonna make this work, you gotta get the, uh, the structure relations to be satisfied. So let's impose those. Okay, so let's impose the brackets. One can solve. You're gonna get some expressions for these parameters that pop up here. And most importantly, you're gonna get some um, expression for B. And one finds this expression right here. When B is non-zero, remember you could always normalize that to B is equal to one. So you get this value for the invariant. It blows up at these exceptional values. But when B is equal to zero, um, so I have this A popping up here. In the calculated expressions for SI, um, right, these, these should be all non-zero. And it turns out that implies that A should be non-zero. So B is equal to zero if and only if uh, rho is plus or minus three or plus or minus a third. In this case, curvature is zero. So at the complex level, you get some embedding into G2. And this correspondingly tells you that for this real form, you get some embedding into the split for your form of G2. And that's the outline of the proof. Okay, so it's, it's a lot it, of it's eigenvalue. So, yep. so you had some previous slide formula for cup. Yep. Uh, this right here. And yeah. how do you see it's zero? If B is zero, then this is all zero. Yeah, but B, B is not zero if you know it's equal to one. So then it's non zero. Then you're, then you're in the D6 case. So th this statement is just covering the D6 case, but these are still valid structure equations even off of the D6 case. No, sorry, that, that, that's so, uh, but rho equal to three gives you flat. Rho is equal to three gives you flat, that's right. But this doesn't correspond to B equal to one. Okay, so here's flat case, right? It does. Yes, but B is on zero. B, so if you plug in rho is equal to three here, okay. B yeah, is equal yeah, to zero. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, so this was an outline. Of course, there's details, of course. Uh, so this does take a bit more work uh, than the type N case to come up with this classification, but the ideas are very much similar. You, you start with this semi-simple element and start normalizing that, um, but there's certainly details. So, uh, okay, but what, can, what else can one, do with this, one can take that Cartan theoretic description, just like in, in lecture two, one can compute holonomy. Okay, so um, one takes the value a la Ambrose Singer uh, style. Okay, so from this, uh, from the, for the algebraic models that we found today, um, one can get to, this, get to this statement. In the N7 case, one gets to five dimensional Heisenberg holonomy. In the D6 case, if I is non zero, you, you get full uh, G2 except when i is equal to zero, so that corresponds to a is equal to zero, you get to SL3. So some of these uh, statements are very reminiscent of, um, of some work of uh, Travis Welsey and Katya Sagersnik um, in recent work. And so, so there they, they use also other tools. Um, so in particular, the Runarovsky conformal structure and did some classification about the conformal holonomy as well as um, holonomy of the ambient, associated amb ambient metric. 
some of these are so so in particular this SL3 case. Um, so one of their holonomy results uh, in one of their papers, an SU12 holonomy uh, algebra came up. So this is a complexification of SU12. Okay, right. This is this is in the complex setting. Okay, so let me just uh, conclude. So some perspectives and outlook. Uh, so these lectures have been an invitation to Carton and parabolic geometry. So some remarks here. So in the 20th century, a canonical Carton, uh, canonical connection is the goal. It's the endpoint of many articles. Uh, it's the solution in the sense of Henri Carton. In the 21st century, um, the Carton perspective is really taken. It should be taken as the input or the starting point for further geometric in investigations. Um, symmetry classification emphasized here is merely one application among many. We presented uh, two natural approaches to symmetry classification via Carton reduction method, and then this p orbits of algebraic models. Effectively, they're equivalent, right? But um, uh, th there are some features that that I like about using this second method, as, as as well as about how you state the final result. But but effectively, they're equivalent. In the parabolic setting, uh, Costin's theorem really is crucial to getting going and identifying this, this fundamental part of the curvature, this harmonic curvature part. Uh, Tanaka prolongation, you also saw, plays a nice role in giving you a, a graded a geometric approximation. So this statement S is contained in uh, this uh, Tanaka prolongation. Right? So, so F, the symmetry algebra, is a filtered sub-deformation of this Tanaka prolongation. And I, I contrasted, I emphasized this difference between coordinate and Lie theoretic descriptions of the results versus Carton theoretic descriptions. And this is really highly lacking in the literature. There's, there's, there's much more that can be done here, I think. Uh, let me conclude. Um, so concerning the 1910 paper, I often think of a, a quote from Bryant that's in uh, Sharp's book from 1997. And he says the following, you read the introduction to a paper of Carton and you understand nothing. Then you read the rest of the paper and you still understand nothing. Then you go back and read the introduction again and there begins to be the faint glimmer of something very interesting. Okay, that's my lecture series. Hope you enjoyed it. I can take some questions. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, because <clears throat> in lectures you concentrated on this parabolic set, and I think uh, the, there are cases such as uh, what you did with uh, Chap and Dubrov on these uh, systems ODEs, and I just wanted to know how much of this machinery can be pushed, sort of uh, all the uh, uh, yeah <clears throat> benefits that you get in parabolic set and other. Uh, settings. It's not necessarily parabolic. Yeah, I mean, uh, so this notion of algebraic model, right? I mean, it's it's flexible. I mean, but of course, uh, I specified what that means in the parabolic setting, and one needs to understand what the equivalence of categories is in other settings. But it's you're you're dealing with, yeah, effectively you're you're dealing with the same type of description. Okay, so you, but you need to identify what your what your structure group is in that other setting. Uh, as well as, um, yeah, some of the derived consequences like uh, S being this filtered sub deformation. Do you have a notion of harmonic curvature? And certainly in the ODE settings, you do. Yes, by the way, so you presented last uh, two weeks ago the second order setting, with, which is a parabolic geometry with SL2 structure. Yeah. So, question there is a paper of Suan Kamran uh, 30 years ago, who's a classified homogeneous model. For second order ODEs under fiber preserving transformations. Fiber preserving. Yeah. So apparently you are saying that you can also set up some uh, algebraic model for that kind of structure and somehow. Do you have? No, I, I didn't say that because I didn't. So is do you have a Carton geometry? This they, they, they didn't address that. This I don't know. I, I'm not sure. At least, uh, you, 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 I don't recall that. So, so there is a new structure. This is clear because uh, Cameron did in several papers before. Absolutely. Carton connection, I never checked. Uh, I don't know. That'd be the first question that I would ask. Uh, you need Carton connection to, to make run this. Okay. No, 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 no. So, so as, as, 
as Pavel has mentioned, I mean, you don't, and as Carton uh, did in his 1910 paper, it wasn't a Carton connection, right? And you can ah, still, okay, class, okay, okay. still classify okay. homogeneous models. But I mean, my approach was like, if you have a Carton connection, let's let's use it, right? Let's find it. Let's, let's uh, I understand, it. I understand. Okay, good. So starting from that, there's two methods that I presented, Carton reduction method, where you, you, you use this fiber equivariancy and then this uh, approach via formulating this algebraic model. Okay. And I'm uh, sorry, uh, I'm not sure I understood the last uh, bullet in blue. What do you want to say? What is really lacking in the literature? What do you want to say precisely? How many, so often the output of, okay, so let me just give you a concrete example here. So often what you see in the literature is the output being just this last part over here, as in the embedding into the Cartan geometry is not stated. The curvature is not stated. So oh, if you just give me this data with some, some structure on it, right? So in this case, I mean, it's a filtered Lie algebra, right? Yes. Um, so, so one can recover and one can integrate structure equations to produce a model, okay, in local coordinates. Fine, that's okay. But you, it's, it's rather, well, extremely difficult just from this to answer questions like, what is the holonomy? associated to this structure. Uh. For curvature, of course, there are, uh, for instance, in, depending on the di di different setting, I mean, for second order ODEs, you have a, uh, a formula, these truss invariants for the harmonic part, right? Uh, and even uh, some, some expressions for the full curvature have been, have been written down, right? But for a holonomy, if you, if you just have this, you know, it, it's hard. I mean, how, do you, how do you even approach that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, um, in terms of what's, uh, for example, Travis and, and Katya, um, they, they, even though they're talking about 235, they're, they're, they're using this Nerovsky conformal structure and their techniques for, in conformal geometry are useful for computing holonomy. Okay, but if I just wanna work on the given geometry under consideration, um, if you just present me the Lee Lee theoretic data, it's not really good enough. Okay. That's, that's my, my personal opinion. Uh, I agree, if, I agree. If, if you're just interested in the list of models, sure, you could do it Lee theoretically, fine. But, you know, as, as a cartoon geometer, I, I feel you should give me more. I fully agree with you, Dennis. I fully agree with you. In principle, it does contain all information. I, but I, I course, fully agree. It work it's really perfectly hard to get to. Yeah, you have to, you have to decode where's holonomy here. Uh, and how I present it, it's, you, could, you could get to holonomy extremely quickly. Uh -huh. And curvature is part of the description. Uh -huh. Right? So I don't have to have a coordinate description of what these curvature formulas look like. This is what it looks like. Okay. And it's where is the, the block over? It's not. <laughs> I'm still trying to find it. <laughs> <laughs> I tried, I tried, but uh, well, I, I only tried for a couple days, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll find it, I'll find it. <laughs> Dennis, can we return briefly to this uh, type three example? Yeah, sure. Um, so the thing that, uh, so you're saying that there are no homogeneous models of constant root type three. That's right. Um, are, no, are there like, well, so homogeneity my... sounds like it would imply constant root type. So uh, are there, is there something crazy like a homogeneous, homogeneous model of non-constant root type? No, no, homogeneity, uh, if, if you're homogeneous, you have constant root type. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and <laughs> my proof here is just that, that you do not have multiple transitive mm. uh, type three guys. Uh, so I haven't given- In my, uh, in my uh, lecture, uh, I will uh, give you 10 lines proof, uh, very elementary of this statement. Uh, okay, great, okay. <laughs> What about, um, so also just unrelatedly on Costin's theorem? Yeah. Is this, this really sounds like deformation theory to me. 
So do you know if that's a, a way that people understand these statements? Like, can you think of the Tanaka prolongation in terms of deformations? Tanaka prolongation in terms of deformations. Um, yeah. Tanaka prolongation is great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, that's more about the flat, uh, right? Like trying to understand what the what a candidate flat model is for your geometry, right? Uh huh. Um, yeah, just purely Tanaka prolongation, I, I would say no. But yeah, I would say no. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question about this ex ex extrinsic Tanaka prolongation. Yeah, sure. yeah. So in the definition, A0 you take to be the annihilator of this um, element in the representation. Mm -hmm. it, it remains well-defined if you take A0 just to be a, a subspace of G0. Okay. And I, I'm wondering why this constraint is here. Is it so that, so that it's adapted to the setting of homogeneous models maybe it's maybe it's a criterion for the prolongation being a lie algebra i mean in terms of what came up in uh in my work with boris i mean this is the exact object that uh, comes up so the as in the you're working with the annihilator of uh of mm -hmm. character, right i mean that's that's effectively what you're doing when you're you're um you're going through the, the Cartan reduction method, right? I mean, you're, you're looking at stabilizers of things, right? An annihilator is an infinitesimal stabilizer. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so, you, so you get a Lie algebra at, at zero level. It's like ta tangent space to the, where the curvature is constant or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so, what did you say, Igor? <laughs> no, I, I meant is it like sort of tangent space to the to the to level set of 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 U invariant? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And then this reminds me, I did have a question about extrinsic Tanaka prolongation as well, which is. How is it related to intrinsic Tanaka prolongation? These are the same. Um, almost. So I mean, uh, so so remember that when you right. So if you're in the cases, so there there were there were exceptional Tanaka prolongation cases amongst the uh, the semi the semi simple cases, right? So um, uh, okay, let me try to formulate this better. So so if I start out with a semi simple guy with a grading. Okay, and then I take the minus part and zero part, and uh, I say, give me the abstract Tanaka prolongation of this. Okay, is it equal to G? Okay, um, then it's that's true almost always, except for some exceptions, namely projective and contact projective. Okay, so in the non-exceptional cases, these these will agree in in the in the uh, yeah. If you start constraining the uh, the G zero level to be this subspace A zero, okay. So um, they they, they will agree, okay. But in the in the projective and contact projective, I'm, I'm slightly unsure. Yeah, I, I haven't really thought about that. But what's relevant for for bounding uh, symmetries is this: you're already working yeah. in the setting of G. I mean, that's coming from the yeah the fact you're you're working with a regular normal uh, Cartan geometry of type GT. And so, um, so this is more relevant. Um, having already solved the equivalence problem, or having already worked, yeah, using that as its starting point. Okay, so the answer is almost always. <laughs> okay, thanks. 